Okay, so our first speaker is going to be Jefferson Bailey from the Internet Archive, and um, I will let him take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, there I am. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I first want to thank Leah and Michelle and Georgetown uh, for inviting me, inviting IA to come and talk. Uh, we work with them a lot, so it's really cool. And I'm really glad to see this event, um, to see web archiving and digital preservation uh, getting more recognition in communities that wouldn't necessarily uh, focus on it. So I am Jefferson Bailey. I'm Program Manager, Partner Specialist at Internet Archive. Um, so, because IA has come up so much in other talks, I guess I should address a couple of things. Uh, uh, just to start off with really quickly, uh, so Rod asked how much data it is. Uh, IA is about uh, 20 petabytes. That's all kind of data. That's not just web data. Um, uh, I would not suggest that storage is simple just because we have a lot of it. Uh, that's over 20,000 spinning disks at any one time, and that's like uh, very, very complicated. Uh, and then, so we actually do uh, collect uh, physical books, too, as Jonathan mentioned. He mentioned something about sort of shoveling them, I think, was the word that he used. Um, so I would like to say that shovels or pitchforks are not part of our collection management strategy. Um, the, the, there are shipping containers. They're climate controlled. Uh, things are preservation treated and cataloged before they're put in there. Uh, so my talk is link rot overruled uh, the variable geometries of preserving the web. Um, and I'll get back to sort of what that means. Uh, so I think because people here can speak much more knowledgeably than I can about the legal issues, uh, about the technical issues, about the business issues, uh, I'm going to focus sort of on archival strategies. I'm an archivist by training. Um, and so I'm going to sort of approach it probably from a somewhat different perspective uh, than people have been talking about and other, some, uh, other archivists and librarians speaking afterwards. So I think uh, hopefully some of these issues will get, uh, you know, more focus. Uh, and my talk is sort of going to talk about intellectual strategies, historical theories of preservation, uh, curatorial strategies. I'll talk about IA. I'll talk about Archivit. I'll talk about other collecting models. Technical strategies a little bit as far as capture, collection management access, uh, and then sort of community strategies. So I start with this slide of a very stern looking Martin Heidegger, um, because I think this quote is a good place to start. Um, he says, the essence of technology is by no means anything technological. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about web archiving, the preservation strategies, and I think when we talk about preserving digital information, especially on the web, uh, we tend to have a very technology-specific focus. Um, you know, it's a problem of networks, it's a problem of protocols, it's a problem of infrastructure. Um, and, you know, those, those are issues, but those exist in social and economic uh, in political contexts that have just as much influence on the problem with link rot and preserving uh, web-based information. Um, so just want to start there and, you know, this will come up a number of times in the talk, uh, but this is like a full ecosystem and lots of influences and in human activity that uh, sort of drives uh, preservation and, you know, the ephemerality of information. Uh, so intellectual strategy. So I said I was going to talk archive stuff. Uh, archives traditionally are seen as material evidence. They assert authenticity. Uh, they're a form of documentation uh, and validity. Uh, so they're very loaded symbols uh, as far as making assertions. And obviously we're talking a lot today about intellectual and uh, argumentative assertions. Um, and my point is mostly that there is a long uh, and rich history of uh, theoretical and practical approaches to uh, preserving archives and records and documentary evidence. Um, I have a long string of names, uh, the Fons concept uh, in, uh, after the French Revolution, the Dutch manual from municipalities in the early 19th century, Hillary Jenkinson in England, blah, 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 lots of names. And my point is not to name drop, and I'm sure most people have not heard of any of these people or these theoretical models, um, but it's just to sort of call out the fact that their uh, archivists uh, and librarians have been working to preserve information um, regardless of format, uh, you know, throughout time. And the web is a new iteration of that with some complications, um, but also, uh, you know, with some solutions existing too. And so, you know, I sort of have a tongue-in-cheek uh, hashtags about papyrus rod and telegram rod and fax <laughs> rod. Um, so, uh, you know, there's lots of many, lots of different formats uh, across time, and they all pose challenges that are, you know, 
addressed by archivist. So <laughs> there are lots of archival strategies. I don't know if people know the site. It's HTTP status dogs. So these, it, it has taken every server response code and given it uh, a picture of a dog, of course. Um, and that is the actual server response for 405 is method not allowed. Um, and I love this because, A, it's geeky and nerdy from, uh, you know, a server and HTTP and Internet perspective, but it's also web culture because it's pictures of dogs and they're doing crazy things. Um, so this one is appropriate because a lot of these archival methods uh, and strategies and theories that have developed over time, uh, you know, are complicated by the web. So this is Luciana Duranti. I have a number of, like, quotation slides. Uh, and uh, this is a good one because I think it speaks to some of the differences uh, that have been drawn out by digital information in the web. Uh, in the digital environment, it's necessary to consider and assess accuracy as a separate quality of a record because of the ease with which data can be corrupted during transmission across space and time. And then more importantly, consequently, accuracy is shifting responsibility that moves over time from the creator's trusted record keeper to the trusted custodian. And so she talks a lot uh, about bridging this world of diplomatics, which is the medieval study of manuscripts and their authenticity, and digital forensics, which uh, we're familiar with forensics like CSI stuff, digital forensics, law enforcement dealing with digital information. Um, and so her, her key point here is that this sort of idea of trustworthiness has shifted from the content creator to the content preserver due to the nature of digital information, how it's shared, how it's disseminated. Um, so how has the web complicated some archival theories? You know, web archiving just as a practice, I have a pretty basic definition here, involves collecting content, preserving those collections, and facilitating use, uh, which I think, you know, sometimes we tend to overlook. Uh, it's complicated, the web is complicated, uh, the act of appraisal, um, and I have a little tagline here, shifting from serenity of inclusion to anxiety of exclusion. Um, and what I mean there is archives used to be very much about a uh, scope of collecting, a uh, mission as far as what that archive goes out and gets. And there was a certain uh, ability to not have to think about what you were not getting. Um, you were not necessarily fully involved with or interacted with the documentary uh, environment uh, in which you were actually collecting content. There's plenty of stuff that was getting lost and you just didn't know it. And I think that's much different on the web. If you have a uh, scope of collection, uh, collecting focus, you can basically find infinite amount of stuff on any topic. Um, and so, and that is information that you interact with and you browse and click around. And so I think this has caused a lot of anxiety about what we're losing by not preserving parts of the web. Um, and that is uh, made appraisal a very big issue. Liz Satai Young, people have obviously uh, brought this point up. Web resources has a very short lifespan and high frequency of change. Uh, the nature of a collection and even the term web archiving and a web archive is very contested. It's very blurry. Uh, you can have something that just gets individual PDFs via collection. You can have something built as a reference uh, or research collection, uh, your traditional special collection. So the idea of what is a Archival collection has changed uh, a lot. It's gotten a lot more loosey-goosey. Um, and also the role of technology. Roger and I have the same, we're both welcoming robots, um, our robot overlords. I framed it as robot archives assistants, <laughs> not overlords. They're working for us. Um, but in preserving the web, um, there is a utilization of technology, um, but it is still a very manual process. And that's, of course, very different than uh, creating archival collections. Um, and so, you know, citation without preservation is the intellectual equivalent of a crawler trap. I'm not sure if people are familiar with the crawler trap. This is uh, the crawler that goes out and gets web pages uh, when it encounters something like, a, dic uh, like a, um, a calendar, which can generate URLs endlessly um, ad infinitum, or a lot of content management systems on the web can actually they generate CSS files automatically in directory and URLs. So the crawler basically can fall into this trap where it just is generating endless URLs uh, and will just continue capturing those what are, you know, tiny little blank pages, but there's still content in aggregate. And that can just keep going and going and going. Um, and then, so Link Bloom, I just wanted to sort of talk about the fact that we can capture a lot of stuff on the web. So I'm just trying to end on a positive note with the slide. Um, it's, you know, we have talked obviously a lot about the challenges and things that disappear, but the amount of material and the sort of democratic spirit 
with which we can collect it. Archives traditionally are very focused on important people, our big institutions. Um, so I think that there's a lot of positives that come out of getting web content, um, both in the breadth and the sort of democratic nature of it. So I'll talk quickly about curatorial strategies, um, Internet Archive, those who don't know, we're a digital library. Brewster's name came up plenty of times. Uh, he did found it in 1996. We're in San Francisco, California. We are a uh, nonprofit. We're a, a, li a recognized library by the state of California, so we are an actual library. Uh, we're housed in this former Christian Science Church. It's open to the public. If you're ever in San Francisco, drop a line. We give tours. We have multiple data centers, but a lot of data is actually served from this building. Um, so that's kind of cool. It's not how uh, data centers usually go. Uh, the Wayback Machine has gotten plenty of mention. There's the URL. It is the largest publicly available web archive in existence. Currently at about 435 billion URLs, um, 80 million websites. It's domain agnostic, so we have, you know, not just us.com.gov, but also lots of European, um, you know, African, all sorts of uh, anything on the Internet. 40 languages, and it's a periodic snapshot, right? So. Uh, it is highly automated. It's not necessarily uh, curated in the, in, in the way that we would generally think of curation. Um, so coming out of Internet Ar uh, Archive's work with Wayback and web archiving, uh, we launched Archive It in February of 2006. This is a uh, subscription service. We work with a number of library archives, museums, universities for them uh, to use. It's a web-based application to create collections of web content. So it includes access and storage. Uh, it's very customizable. It's a whole web app. Um, so you use it to manage your collections, uh, both as far as building them, uh, managing the crawls, uh, selection and scoping. There's cataloging and metadata. Uh, of course, all content is ap applicable as far as what you're capturing. So that includes social media, uh, database, password protected stuff if you have the password. Uh, it's browsable within 24 hours after the crawl completes. Uh, and it is full text search enabled, so that's, uh, you know, not something that is uh, possible with the Wayback Machine. Um, so how are these two things different? These are obviously just sort of parallels. And these are two different curatorial strategies and methods of collection. You know, one is a big, uh, mostly automated, very broad crawl, wide crawl as we call it. Uh, it's one big collection. It's a periodic snapshot. It doesn't pretend to do a lot of QA. Um, it's URL specific as far as how you can discover things through it. It's totally free and there's public, uh, public access. Archivit is much different. It utilizes a lot of the same technologies, but it has a different curatorial goal and intent. It's focused collections and you can read the list for yourself. So who's using Archivit as far as like preserving the web? 326 institutions, over 2,600 public web archive collections. And just within Archivit itself, it's uh, you know, over 9 billion URLs. So it's a little hard to read, but you know you can see this breakdown as far as institution types. We work, you know, a lot with cultural heritage institutions, so it's a lot of library uh, archives and museums. So here's like a quick use case. Uh, uh, this is the uh, Latin American uh, Network Infor uh, Information Center at UT Austin. So they collect a lot of Latin American government sites. Uh, this is uh, this use case came out of uh, the Honduras. Uh, there was a coup around 2009, so here's the pres presidential page in 2008. Uh, in 2009, while the coup was ongoing, you see this is just like a, a Red Hat, this is just a server technology, so this is just a generic page that comes up. There's actually no content at the presidential website uh, in Honduras at that point. And then, of course, uh, someone has taken over, so after the coup is a new is a, a totally new content. So this is information that would have entirely disappeared from the web. Um, and this was, you know, a whole country's presidential record uh, in online existence. Um, so that's a big use case. Uh, other sort of curatorial strategies in this, in, in this sort of theme, uh, thematic topic collections, uh, those are pretty specific to people. Uh, and people know those pretty well. Institutional memory. Uh, legal mandates, so a lot of state libraries and archives are required to preserve uh, the documents of the state government uh, that they report to. Um, so there's a lot of that broad domain crawling. I mentioned that with way back. Uh, a lot of uh, institutions are using it to capture information that used to be in print form that has now gone onto the web. Uh, so we've heard examples of that already. Resources are, of course, sometimes intentionally taken on, uh, offline. That's always worth remembering. Um, so that's another use. Research and reference collections, spontaneous events. 
So technical strategies, there are some of the PetaBoxes uh, at Internet Archive. They hold 1,000 terabytes each. They weigh about uh, a little over a ton. Um, so another slide, this is Bruno Latour. So technological projects that remain purely technological are like moralist. Their hands are clean, but they don't have hands. So it's a great quote. It's very similar uh, to the Heidegger quote. Um, Latour is sort of known for the actor network theory. Uh, and this is that there are many networks and actors that have their own uh, agendas and influences and that these, uh, you know, have impacts on techno technological projects and technology. And I think this is incredibly relevant to the web and preserving the web. Um, and, you know, understanding those is just as necessary as understanding, um, you know, the history of archival accessioning or um, the history of web development itself. So what are some examples of a bad actor? Well, uh, I'm surprised to have the first Lionel Hutz reference, um, but it's from The Simpsons, of course. You know, he says, I'm uh, moved for a bad court thingy, and sort of rephrase that into a bad link thingy. Uh, but of course, you know, there are bad actors in every network, uh, and that will impact um, what our expectations for their behavior are. So 417 is expectation. We expect people and uh, organizations to operate in certain ways, and of course they don't because we're all human and do lots of different things. So uh, as far as like specific technical uh, tools that we use in Internet Archive um, and developed most of these, and they're open source, so they're widely used in the broader community. Heratrix is the web crawler. It's what goes out and gets stuff. Umbra is a pretty recent uh, piece of technology that we developed. Uh, people have mentioned a little bit about uh, JavaScript and dynamic driven content on the web. The web is really involved into a programming environment instead of a documentary environment, as David Risenthal has talked about uh, in papers. So Umbra actually launches a browser and mimics clicking and scrolling automatically. So it uh, sort of uh, imitates human behavior working in a browser. Uh, to find URLs and uh, create actions that it can then pass to Heratrix, which actually captures the content. So Wayback is actually just a piece of software. People know it because of the Wayback machine. Wayback is just a piece of software for browsing archived web pages. So lots of people actually use Wayback, um, the piece of software. Uh, data sets are another form of access I'll talk about really quickly uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, and then, of course, I mentioned uh, search as far as archivit. So Nutchwax is a full text search technology. And Solar is not an archivit <coughs> developed product, but for metadata. Ship. So I talked about sort of data and how is this enhancing access. And I think this is an interesting one. Um, people have sort of mentioned APIs and, uh, you know, machine access to collections. And that hasn't really... Um, that's what happened for the content of web pages themselves. So I think one thing that we're starting to explore that we're excited about uh, is uh, sort of uh, access to the data behind web archives. So this is uh, extracting specific me metadata elements and how those can be used uh, in a number of ways. And I've called a couple out here. Link graph analysis is looking at what links to what uh, and what links back to what. And if there's lots of things linking to something and you're not capturing that something, why aren't you? So uh, it's kind of, it's not really, it's sort of like PageRank. People are familiar with Google PageRank. This is a little different and to help people find content of interest to their collecting activities. Uh, automated QA and selection, um, how can, you know, technology tools help us do these things that are really hard to do at scale with web archives. Uh, and then research services. So, you know, a point that maybe hasn't really come up as, mu as much today is that preservation requires access. So something that's not used a lot is something that is not going to be preserved. Um, so with web archives, really, a lot of the uh, access mechanisms right now are sort of uh, you browse the historical web just as you browse the live web. Um, but we're really interested in looking at ways that you can interact with the content and data of web archives uh, outside of the sort of browsing model. So when I talk about that, uh, my animated GIF works. That's awesome. Technology <laughs> wins. Um, so this is actually another Latin American government document archives collection, also at UT Austin. Uh, this is about a 10 terabyte collection of about 105 million URLs. So we pulled out uh, every URL has an IP address uh, that the crawler understands when it actually crawls the site. Uh, we pulled all of them out and made the, and geolocated them and made this visualization. This is Vinay Gol, who's one of our data engineers, did this, and he's awesome. Um, so this is sort of one way that people, and you can look, this is a Latin American government document collection, but actually look at the global scope of this collection. 
Um, and you can see how it's grown, and it's certain this is about, a, I think, an eight-year time span. Um, certain areas have specific focus. Uh, some areas grow faster than others. So these are ways that you can understand a web archive and a collection and your collecting activity sort of at aggregate. Uh, and that's very data-driven. So community strategies, uh, some of these have come up. People have talked about the IAPC. Uh, they've started to explore collaborative collection development. Um, the 2014 election crawling, five minutes, thanks. Um, David Walsh at GPO mentioned uh, NARA and GPO and LC working together to crawl elections. There's a project uh, also with uh, Stanford, Berkeley, and Oberlin College. It's also looking at crawling election content. It's not necessarily candidate sites. Uh, so these are cool examples of collaborative initiatives. I think there's a lot of room for collaborative collection development. Uh, consortial initiatives, so uh, the Legal Information Preservation Alliance, and Margaret Mays is here. Um, she can talk uh, about this to people. Uh, and Georgetown Law Library is a member of a consortial archivit account. So I think uh, organizations working together to uh, you know, fund their web archiving activities is a great model. Crowdsource collections, we do a lot of these at Archivit. So we have a Ferguson one I'll show really quickly, Occupy. Uh, I think we just launched an Ebola one the other day. Don't get too excited about the Ebola collection. Uh, <laughs> uh, so these are ones where you sort of like get public nominations, but we also work with academics and curators for them to add uh, seeds or URLs for us to crawl. Um, so that's an interesting sort of model of lots of people contributing content. Uh, ideas, and then we do the capture and storage and access. Uh, spontaneous events is the same idea. Government shutdown, Boston Marathon, the Ukraine collection got a lot of uh, notific uh, a lot of notice uh, as that's gone on. And then like sort of advocacy and outreach. So we work with a lot of K-12 programs uh, and library graduate school programs in library science uh, as far as advocating for web preservation and archiving. So here's the Occupy one. This is actually a really good example and a great collection because a lot of this went offline because it was such uh, a sort of you know quick movement and so DIY in nature, uh, 26 million URLs, about a terabyte. Uh, the Ferguson one, I'll mention this one really quickly. I'm running out of time. Um, but this is a great one because we both are soliciting content from the community. We're also working with Washington University, which is in St. Louis, uh, and they're building their own sort of analog and paper and image collection. So we're working with them to get web content. And then we also worked with someone at Maryland Institute of Technology and the Humanities who crawled all of Twitter. We extracted all the links from like a week of Twitter crawling, which was hundreds of thousands, and we're going to be adding those to the collection too. So sort of content and seed nominations coming from multiple places. So wrapping up, another community strategy, the NDSA is the National Digital Stewardship Alliance, 2013 Web Archiving Survey, if you're more interested in what the US is doing as far as web archiving, came out yesterday. So I put a bit.ly URL in there, oh no. <laughs> I realized that after Roger talked, and I was like, oh crap, I can't change my slide. Um, but I should say, some URL shorteners are actually uh, working with certain institutions to back up um, all those redirects. So uh, sh 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 shorteners are not the worst. So they do, some of them have a preservation strategy. So, but this is of course hosted by the Library of Congress, so it will last forever. Um, so I talked about variable geometries, and this is another Latour phrase. Um, and, uh, you know, I've sort of talked about how there's different curatorial methods, the public, uh, experts, broad crawling, there's different intellectual strategies. Um, and this is sort of a web archiving life cycle which comes out of uh, the digital uh, curation life cycle. It's a similar model. And it's kind of confusing to look at. And my point was mostly that it's not one model for preserving the web. It's actually, it's a variable geometry of many networks, many actors, many models economic, social, cultural, political, um, so, and of course, technological. Um, so credits, I think I'm the only person that's had credits in their slide, and we're at a citation event. Um, <laughs> that's kind of crazy. Uh, but you'll see I actually put all of these in way back, so I thought that was, that was a nice touch too. That's it, thanks. I did want to mention really quickly because I'm out of time, but Internet Archive, archive.org is uh, re the site. There's a full redesign of the site and it's launching next week and there's a big party if you're in San Francisco open to the public. And Archivit 5.0 is also releasing at the same time. So lots of stuff happening that's coming up. So thanks.
And now we'll hear from Herbert von der Sample from um, Los Alamos National Laboratory with digital library research and prototyping. Oh, oh there was uh, another dog. Yeah, yeah, I put the 404 one up last. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, first, uh, thanks to the organizers for giving uh, me the opportunity uh, to talk here. Uh, since this is not a technological problem, I will talk about technology. <laughs> and I'd like to start actually by uh, acknowledging Michael Nelson, who sits there. Uh, everything I'll talk about, uh, the ideas, the solutions that I'll talk about, I've developed with him over uh, the past couple of years. Uh, he could be speaking here as well as I uh, can, but I have the better accent. <laughs> <laughs> so these are uh, the topics uh, that I'll discuss. First, I'll give you uh, my perspective on the link rot problem domain by talking about the creation of pockets of persistence. And then I'll talk about three essential components uh, of a solution. One is uh, the capture of materials that are being referenced. Then, once a capture has been made, how to reference those materials, and then how to access uh, those materials. So these, this is kind of the outline of my presentation. So first, the way I look at the link rot problem is not simply by, well, links are dead, but I look at the problem as one of creating the capability to revisit the web of the past or the web of the now, for that matter, at some point in the future. And in trying to solve it, we are actually pretty ambitious because we would like to do that in a persistent, a precise, and a seamless way. And these things will actually come back uh, further. So I'll give you examples of what exactly I mean uh, by this revisiting uh, the web of the past. So first of all, well, this is a Wikipedia page of one of my favorite bands, uh, Coil, industrial group out of uh, the UK. And when you scroll down uh, in that page, there's an external, uh, a list of external references to the Wikipedia article. And I click on that link, and then I get the 404. So clearly, that's something that we do not want. This is part of the problem that we're trying to solve. But there's another one. And it was actually mentioned earlier uh, today by Razel. And it's this one here. Because sometimes link work, but they don't work really in the ways that we would want them to work. Definitely not when you think of it from the perspective of the record and you know the accuracy of the record. So this is an old version of the page about COIL. And there's a link down there to the page, again in Wikipedia, for Peter Christofferson, one of the band members, also known as Sleazy. Now, this page is uh, dated October, uh, early October 2010. Now, I click that link, and I arrive at this page, which is actually the current page about Peter Christofferson. And here it says that Peter Christofferson died on November 25, 2010. So that's a month later than the page I just visited. So this is, of course, interesting. But when I look at it from time travel of the web, really taking a slice of the web as it was in the past, which I think we're talking about here when talking about integrity of the record, then I really would have liked to got this page, the page that was active in October, early October 2010, where it says that, indeed, Sleazy was still alive. So this problem of revisiting the web as it existed at some point in the past, of course, exists for the web at large. But the problem is that not too many communities actually care about solving that problem. We've heard uh, earlier today from Karen that there's a lot of focus on forgetting, not on remembering. But there are actually communities that really care about solving it. This is one. But there's also the scholarly communication community, online journalism community, Wikipedia, where there's an active uh, discussion group about link crop and so on. And in my opinion, the solutions need to come from these communities in collaboration. They need to find interoperable and similar kinds of solutions and approaches to tackle this issue. 
It's onto the three components. First of all, I'll talk about capturing materials that are uh, referenced. And here I want to bring a perspective that is different to the one we've heard from uh, Jefferson. Not that what he said was wrong, but it's just a complementary approach. So Jefferson talked about what the Internet Archive does, just going out on the web and collecting materials recurrently. He also talked about what Archive-It does, basically selecting certain topics on the web, like you know, the issue in Ferguson, and collecting those materials. The perspective I bring here is that there are collections of items that are important to certain communities. In your case, legal documents. In the case of scholarly communication, journal literature, for example. In the case of Wikipedia, the Wikipedia articles. And I call these the seed collections. And these communities care about them. And these seed collections are referencing to resources on the web at large. And the perspective here is that, well, obviously, these communities want to preserve the seed collections, but they also want to preserve that web context that sits around it. And so the idea is that these items in these collections go through important moments in life cycles, as all documents do. And at these moments in life cycles, you actually want to capture the resources that are referenced by these items in the collection. Okay? And so what these life cycle items are depend on the nature of the collection. So when you talk about scholarly communication, for example, you may want to capture during the authoring process when an author is creating a manuscript. But you could also capture when the manuscript is submitted to a manuscript review system. You could capture during the peer review process. You could capture when something is being uh, published. You could actually capture when the material later on is being used, for example, annotated. The idea that I'm trying to convey is that there's a seed collection of items that the community cares about, but it is surrounded by a web context that evolves over time, where links will break, where content will evolve. And you take life cycle moments in these items to create captures of these linked resources. Very much like in our own lives, when there's important moments in our life cycle, we take pictures of ourselves and of our beloved ones. So again, what these important moments are depend on the kind of collection, but it's a notion of there are important moments. At these moments, you want to take captures. There's infrastructure that allows us to do that already. There's the web archives, and increasingly web archives allow us now to capture on demand. So they allow us to submit a URI, the archive will make a capture, and it will give us a URI of the captured resource uh, in return. PermaCC is just one example, where during the process of authoring legal documents, one could submit a URI, capture the reference resource, put the URI of the capture in uh, your document. In the hyperlink project, that researchers reference slots for scholarly communication, we are looking into ways to do this in a seamless and scalable manner. One example here is we've experimented with uh, Sotero, which is a reference uh, manager, and created an extension for it where when an author during the manuscript phase is bookmarking web pages, underneath the hood, the web page is being archived, so it's being pushed into the Internet Archive or Archive Today. The author doesn't even know this is happening. So under the hood, these captures are being made. And the information about the capture, so the URI of the capture, the daytime of capture, as well as the original URL, you know, that was bookmarked, is saved in the Sotero database. We have another experiment going. And this is about capturing during the manuscript submission phase. So a manuscript is submitted to a repository. At that moment, there's a service that is being alerted. New manuscript submitted. The service grabs the manuscript, parses it for all the URIs that are pointing to the web at large, and pushes them basically into web archives around the world. So this is where you start doing uh, this archiving on demand, not on a one per one basis, but really at scale for entire uh, documents from a collection. 
it was alluded to earlier uh, today by Ed, I think, if I remember correctly. If you want to do this on-demand capture at scale, you need interoperability. This is not just about an API for one system. This is about an interoperable API across many archives around the world because where you want to push a certain resource may depend on the nature, its mime type, its content, its language, its jurisdiction, and so on. So we want interoperability for on-demand capture. Very simply said, we have an interface in, well, the URI that you want to capture, and the interface out, you get the URI of the capture and the daytime of the capture back. That would be the simplest possible interoperable interface for on-demand uh, capture. So enough said about capture. I'm now going to talk about once we have a capture of such a resource, how are we going to reference it? And this is actually a very important uh, problem. The existing practice of doing this is once we made a capture, we have the URI of the capture, and that's actually what we're going to link to. And while doing so, we're throwing away the original URL that actually was captured, and we're forgetting about the daytime of the capture, basically. This is terrible. This is terrible on one hand, to an extent, because it is now impossible to actually revisit the original URL. I mean, there's really cases where you would go want to see what is there now, you know, at some point in the future. But the biggest problem here is that you have now become completely dependent on the permanent existence and uptime of that one archive in which you have put the capture. To say this differently, you replaced one link rot problem with another, okay? This is a very serious uh, problem, and this is something we really want to avoid. Now, if there's some in the room that think that archives are forever, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. This is Web Citation. They actually were pioneers in this realm of on-demand archiving. They've been around, I think, for about 10 years, and it's something where scholarly authors could submit to URI get a capture made, get the reference back to put in their articles. They were in very serious financial problems last year. They had to do a fundraiser. They're still operating, but their long-term existence is definitely uh, questionable. The same archive has been down for several days in a row in August of this month. So if you had a link pointing in them during these days, that link would just not work, and you had no fallback mechanism because the original URI was gone, okay? This here, mummify.it, was a web archiving service that was launched sometime, I think, uh, last year. It was a commercial service, so one could actually get a subscription, and then you were allowed for a certain amount of money to submit a certain number of uh, captures. So they were actually a web archive with a business model, so they, you know, thought about long-term sustainability, financial sustainability. Well, the only remnant of this web archive is this page in the Internet Archive. <laughs> okay. So, although I respect very much, actually, that PermaCC thinks about sustainability in the long term by creating a consortium of libraries, that's all extremely good news. The message that I'm trying to convey is that we really have to think about all of this in a distributed way. The notion of one archive doesn't cut it, we need multiple, in multiple locations, in multiple jurisdictions, and uh, so forth. So what we really would want to do to avoid the problem that I just described is when we link to these captures to hold on to all the information we have. The original URI, yes, the URI of the capture, obviously, and the capture daytime. These three pieces of information provide us everything we need to in a persistently revisit this information over time. The original URI is the key in every single web archive around the world, okay? We can use that to find captures in all web archives around the world. If you have the daytime, we can become specific and say, well, actually, I need a capture around that moment in time. And as I will talk about in a bit, with Memento, 
you can actually automatically obtain the appropriate capture when you have an original URL and the capture daytime, okay, irrespective of the archive that it sits in. By the way, what I'm talking about is actually not at all so revolutionary. We do this already on paper and online. We have that information. See, this is the reference I showed you earlier. It's there. The URI of the capture is there. The original URI is there. The capture daytime is there. It's only not there in a machine actionable way. It's there in a way that a human can consume. So we need to do basically this, but in an interoperable way that is consumable uh, by machines. So a way to convey not just a link, but an annotation to the link also that makes sure that these three crucial pieces of information are available to us. The URI of the capture, the original URI, and the capture daytime. There's actually efforts going on in that reel. One uh, I'm involved in. This is the missing link proposal, which was actually printed out. It's out there on the table. Thank you so much uh, to the organizers. There's another, which is a collaboration with Harvard University. There's a W3C community group. It uh, goes by the name of Robustness and Archiving Community. These efforts are all about how exactly are we going to convey this information in HTML so tools, machines can consume it. This is what the missing link proposal looks like. I don't want to bother you with too much technical details, but basically what happens here, the original URI is what actually is really being linked to. This goes along the lines of what Ed said earlier, do no harm. And that is then augmented or annotated basically with the capture URI and the daytime of the capture or the daytime of the link for that matter. Third topic is access. So once we have these captures in one or more archives, how do we access them? And this is where I'm going to promote Memento. How many people are familiar with Memento actually in the room? Oh yeah, Michael, <laughs> really? <laughs> so that's not enough, so I'm going to introduce <laughs> Memento to you. Memento, by the way, is supported by the Internet Archive, Archive it, and many web archives uh, around the world. So Memento is a technical protocol, and it's a very simple extension of the HTTP protocol that makes the web tick. And what it does, it introduces the notion of time to HTTP. And basically, it allows you to say that I have this URI. I am not interested in seeing it the way it is today. I'm interested in seeing this URI as it was at some moment in the past, okay? And it's actually magic when you see that work. So this is the current page of this event with the URI listed down there. I select the daytime in the past, in this case, June 8 uh, of this year, and automatically the Memento protocol and associated infrastructure will lead me to the capture that is temporally closest to the daytime that I've expressed. And in this case, this is a capture of May 3rd, 2014, that is in the Internet Archive. So what you see here is that this is not the exact date that I've asked for, the reason being that no capture was made on that date. However, if I would have made explicitly a capture on June 8, that's exactly what I would have gotten back, note, only using the original URI and the daytime. I didn't even know, need the URI of the capture, okay? I needed the original URI, I needed the daytime to arrive at this stuff. You can do this yourself, okay? This is not only for Michael and myself. You can do this. We have an extension for the Chrome browser. Go to mementoweb.org and you'll see this picture. You can click it. It lead you to the extension, you install it, and you travel through time across the web. This, by the way, does not only work for web archives, it works for versioning systems also, as long as they're Memento compatible. So for example, we have a proxy solution to make Wikipedia Memento compliant. So you can basically travel Wikipedia at the slice in time, a time of your choice. 
So what I'm going to do now is run you through a couple of scenarios to emphasize the importance of holding on to all that information that I talked about. <clears throat> so first, you, you see, you, I have five or so slides that look exactly like this. First of all, it's about, is an on-demand capture, so we explicitly ask to make a capture, is that available or not? Do you have the URI of the capture? Do you have the original URI available? Do you have the daytime available? And I'll walk you through a couple of scenarios. So in this case, what we're looking at, yes, at one point in time, we did make an on-demand capture. It is available, and it's accessible because the archive that has it is actually operational at this moment. And have the URI of the capture. Well, all is great now. I just click on the URI of the capture, and I retrieve the exact capture that was made. No problems at all. The time travel in this case is precise because I got the exact thing, and it's seamless because I just clicked. It is not persistent, however. And the reason I say that relates exactly to this point of we are missing information. If that one archive indeed has the capture, but for one reason or another is not accessible, be it temporally or forever, we are now dead in the water. We have nothing anymore, right? Because now we click that capture URI and we get a 404 or we get a 503 or whatever you know. So in this case, time travel is neither persistent, neither precise, neither seamless anymore. I have nothing. This is what I mentioned earlier. One link rod problem replaced by another one. Now, the same scenario that capture is not you know, accessible, but I have all the other information. I have the URI of the capture, I have the original URI, and I have the daytime. Well, this is where we can use Memento now. We can time travel with Memento just using the original URI and the daytime. I will actually find the capture nearest to the daytime that you know, is available in some web archive. So I won't get that exact capture because that archive is down. Okay, but I will get something close to it from any web archive around the world. So in this case, I do have persistent time travel. It's not precise because I don't get the exact capture, and it's not seamless because Memento is currently not natively supported by browsers. You need a plugin in order to make it work. But other than that, we're in business here. I alluded to this scenario before. So let's presume that Explicit capture is available, but I don't have the URI of the capture. I do have the other two pieces of information, the original URI and the daytime. With Memento, I will now retrieve the exact capture from the archive in which the capture resides, on, uh, only, of course, if that uh, archive is Memento compatible. Okay? In this case, we have persistent and precise time travel. Last scenario, we didn't make an on-demand capture. So we didn't do our homework, we just let it go. And now we're relying on Archive-It, Internet Archive, and so on, to have made certain captures at some moment in time. Well, in this case, again with Memento, I will use the original URI and the daytime to at least retrieve some capture from some archive, okay? So when it comes to interoperability for time travel, the Memento protocol is there. It is supported by web archives. It can be supported by versioning systems, okay? We need to make this seamless, though. So what we need to aim for is native support by browsers so that we don't need this plugin, so that it just works uh, for everyone across the board. There's infrastructure underlying all of this, one of them called the Memento aggregator. Uh, that needs to be made more robust and sustainable. That is really a thing to do here. Uh, but again, this is something that could be do, uh, done in a community collaboration. So to wrap it up, what I've tried to say is that significant technical solutions, infrastructure, and ideas already exist to solve the problem that we're talking about. But they need to be spread out, they need to be adopted, and we need to mobilize the communities that care 
about this problem to get this off the ground in a joint kind of fashion. Or to put it differently, link rot is really solved, let's now solve it. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions for either Jefferson or Herbert? Okay, so, uh, Herbert, uh, one of the things I was talking about before was the challenge for publishers in getting an accurate and persistent link to things that are in Supreme Court or judicial opinions, statutes, things like that. Two problems. One is it's a big volume of work, and API might take care of that. Um, it sounds like Dave Zvenich and PermaCC actually have fixed that problem since I made that statement earlier this morning. There now is an <laughs> API that does that. I love the world. Um, it sounds like Memento might address the second problem, which is that even if you created a PermaCC uh, link today to that resource, it might have changed since the, even if, it's re even if the link resolves, it might have changed since the page was cited. If the citation happened in 2006, and I create a link to that same URI today, you have obviously the change problem. But it sounds like Memento might address that. If I could, if I could travel back in time and say, look, when I create that link, I'm going to create a link to the Memento archive through uh, Internet Archive or others to the date that the citation occurred. Uh, that would allow me to have a lot more confidence in the uh, veracity or the version of the source. Yes? Um, well. Uh, Two things. So first of all, uh, when a capture is made and a URI is associated with that capture, one expects, hopes, that the capture itself will never change anymore. That's really the reason to make the capture. So with that regard, we have stability uh, of the capture. So the connection between the URI of the capture and um, the capture itself, as well as the original URI, and the daytime of the capture, that is now solid. Okay. The original resource on the web will keep evolving. That's for sure. Right? That's the content drift problem uh, that I talked about. As long as we have the original URI and the daytime, we're in business. And someone has made a capture somewhere, we're in business because Memento indeed will be able to bring us to the appropriate uh, capture as I tried to show, even without having the URI of the capture. Now, I'm not advocating at all against putting the URI of the capture in there, not at all, because as I said, that's the most seamless approach, right? I'm advocating in favor of not throwing away, as you mentioned earlier, not doing you know, anything evil, so don't throw away the original URI, because at one point or another, that archive in which we have the capture may go away, or it may just relocate to somewhere else on the web. And now again, we have a problem. So the big message is here, yes, capturing, fantastic, but referencing a capture only by means of the URI of the capture, evil. <laughs> it's as evil as a bitly. Awesome, thank you. So I, I have a question um, partly about the Internet Archive, but also just about um, uh, collections that are available through Memento. And, and this may be a naive sort of framing of my um, understanding, and that is about robots.txt. Um, is is robots.txt, um, can it reach back into the past to make things unavailable? My understanding is that the Internet Archive respects robots.txt as it is today. So if I go there today to xyz.com and it says disallow everything, but somebody has gone through the work to capture everything in the past, your adherence to or sort of support for that protocol says, sorry, current domain owner has recaptured that. Is, is that a misunderstanding of it? And if, if it's not a misunderstanding, how do you get around that? Or are there alternatives to find that kind of information? Uh, that's a hard one to answer. So you mean, does it respect current robots exclusions for previously captured content? Correct. Right. It's not a temporal nature to robots.txt. It's what is today's version versus yesterday's capture? Right. So that exclusion is only put in place to be applied to the current website, right? No, actually. No? No. I have actually a wonderful, uh, if I may. I <laughs> <laughs> Michael, come on. <laughs> uh, uh, no, actually, and there's a this is a fantastic question, actually, because it so shows uh, the importance of 
multiple archives and them being interoperable uh, and all. So um, a while ago, uh, the Conservative Party in the UK took down all the speeches of Cameron uh, because he had, of course, said things that he then later didn't do or actually acted even against uh, whatever he had said. Those speeches were available in the Internet Archive. And uh, so they removed them from the Conservatives' website and they knew about the Internet Archive's policy and they actually put the robots.txt in, you know. And basically what um, Internet Archive then does, as soon as a robot.txt is in place in the current environment, it also doesn't serve the past content anymore. Mm -hmm. So basically, these people from the Conservative Party were very smart. Not only did they remove that content, but they also made sure that according to the policies of the Internet Archive, it wouldn't be served anymore. And this is why it's such a great story, because the speeches were also available in other web archives around the world, for example, the UK archives and, you know, others archive today and so on. And with Memento, one, again, automatically would find them in these other archives. We wouldn't find anything anymore. So basically time travel, do you arrive of a certain speech of Cameron sometime in the past, pick yours, whatever. And well, the Internet Archive didn't respond anymore but the other archives did. And so all of these speeches we were recoverable in other web archives around the world. Yeah. Do you have any idea if the um, Internet Archive still has them, but has just, they've just gone dark? Or Not if sure. they're gone, does anyone know? Oh, interesting. Not sure. Yeah. All right. All right. We would have to ask Brewster, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, then we will be taking a 15-minute break. That's great. Yeah, I thought it was fun. <laughs> <laughs>